In 2017, there were more than 59 million Hispanics living in the United States. And by 2030, 75 million. I mean, we're a country within a country. That's not going to change. We're just shy of the size of Germany and 10 million more people in France. It's a country. Welcome to the Smart Talk series, the show for professionals who want strategies, tips, and real talk about all things PR, marketing, and social media. Your host is Melissa Vela Williamson, an award-winning, accredited, and nationally recognized PR pro and communication thought leader. And now your host, Melissa Vela Williamson. Hello, and welcome to the Smart Talk series. I'm Melissa Vela Williamson. This season, our focus is on communication trailblazers. Today, I'm joined by Yvonne Bonnie Garcia. Bonnie Garcia founded Market Vision in 1998 after 22 years in corporate marketing because she saw a void in shopper, promotional, and grassroots marketing that would engage multicultural consumers. Since then, she's expanded the business from three Latinas and a telephone into a multi-million dollar marketing design firm that uses a human-centered approach to reveal insights about a person's behavior, inspiring ideas on how to connect with them in meaningful ways. Welcome, Bonnie. Thank you, Melissa. It's great to be here, and thank you so much for the invitation. There is so much our listeners could learn from your experience and background, and of course, your personal story. Tell us a little bit more about your background and your work today. Well, I guess my first real encounter with advertising and marketing started back in college. I attended UT Austin School of Communication, and my focus was uh, radio, television, and film. And I needed to work my way through college, so I got this wild hair and decided to try my hand in becoming a disc jockey or a disc jacket at the time. Mm -hmm. So I put together a little cassette, yes, I'm dating myself, (laughs) and went to apply at the number one radio station, KHFI FM Austin. And lo and behold, I got the job. And that's really where I learned about producing radio ads and promotions and event marketing. And from there, I went to work for a couple of other stations here in San Antonio, KTFM and KTSA, and uh, moved on to the Muscular Dystrophy Association as a program director after that stint in radio. And from there, I ended up working for a major brewery and Coca-Cola leading their marketing efforts. But along the way, I leveraged my Latina heritage and knowledge of being able to live in, in two worlds, to hone my skills, to become one of the first Latinas to lead Hispanic marketing efforts for major corporations. And this led me to eventually opening up my own marketing firm, Market Vision, 24 years ago. So today, we're one of the few national Latina-owned agencies in the United States, and we still work with Fortune 500 companies, government entities, both on the national and regional level. We design marketing campaigns that put people at the center of everything we do. And that's true to our MV core from the beginning. It's human-centered design is a key to building stronger relationships with consumers and customers alike. So that's where we are today. And, you know, it's been quite the journey, uh, 24 years working with some of the major corporations from Coca-Cola to General Mills, and the list goes on. We've had quite the client roster over our years in business. That's really incredible. And I love that story and how organically it grew. And you talked about leveraging your Latina heritage. So I want to dive a little bit deeper into that because this concept of leveraging our backgrounds, sometimes when I talk to pros, particularly professionals of color, sometimes they're not putting all those dots together. So I I love that you did that early on and you're certainly a trailblazer in the Hispanic marketing and advertising industry because you saw that concept probably years before a lot of your peers. So what was that inspiration? You know, it was quite by chance. When I went to go work for the Muscular Dystrophy Association, my responsibility was to develop fundraising programs. And as one of the only Latinas here in the San Antonio office, I noticed that they had been doing a lot of the same things over the years. They had skate-a-thons, bolathons, walk-a-thons, you name it, every a thon possible. Well, living in San Antonio, where 65% of the population is Hispanic, yes, we do like to do those things, but guess what? We also love food and music and family fun. 
So I came up with an idea and proposed the first Halloween fajita cook-off in Market Square and was able to get the Express News, local radio stations, Budweiser, Coca-Cola sponsors. And in that weekend, we raised more money than six months of all these athons we had been doing over the years. And, you know, lo and behold, the program went on for 10 years, even after I left the organization. So this is when I really realized that understanding Hispanics' culture and passions was marketing magic. And uh, from this event, you know, I met several Latino marketing managers with Coke and other companies and began a network and ultimately landed my first job in corporate America, first with the Stroh Brewery Company in Texas. And then I went on to lead their Hispanic marketing efforts nationally from my office in Detroit. And then I went on to become director of Hispanic marketing for Coca-Cola North America. So, you know, that Halloween fajita cook-off in San Antonio opened my eyes to the power of Hispanic marketing. And I love that you grew that so organically and from a nonprofit, because sometimes when I talk to professionals or aspiring students, they're thinking of the big corporations right away. Right. And I've always said there's so much you can learn from inside of a nonprofit because you get to do more things in the communication industry aisles and you get to try more things and people give you a lot of grace there but you can make strong connections with corporations from the nonprofit seat absolutely and like you did bonnie a great idea can be helpful to everyone involved so i I think that's really incredible and you really met the community where they are and being in a market where you may have majority of the population being from what was before or called before a minority population, like you should go where the numbers are if you're marketing, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. So what has surprised you as you've kind of led the way into Hispanic marketing, you know, first from the local level and then up to the national level, like back when you got started? You know, the biggest surprise was the lack of research, limited knowledge. Most companies didn't have a whole lot of research regarding the Hispanic market opportunity. Univision and Telemundo were doing some research, but I really had to start from square one when I began leading the efforts both at Stroh's and at Coca-Cola. So really had to engage research companies that would help me better understand the Hispanic market, the different subcultures, the cultural nuances of each subculture, the language differences, their brand preferences, you know, and the sales opportunities and purchasing power. So back in the day, there was just such limited research uh, regarding the Hispanic marketplace. Yeah, I I find that, you know, there's still opportunities to grow in that space. And I think even though now we have some data, it's being able to draw the insights from that as communicators and then almost prove the business case, right? I think we're still having to do that today. (laughs) I'm telling you, it's still very, very surprising to me when I do interact with major Fortune 500 companies that they are not researching the, the opportunity still to this day that exists with the Hispanic marketplace. So yeah, it is mind boggling that 25 years after I started my career, we're kind of still in the same place that we were back then. Yeah, I think there's a lot of people saying that in multiple fronts. But you know, just for anyone listening, right, our listeners, the US census results, which also came out as to be undercounted in the minority area as it had been previously, but probably even more so this last time around. But It's just we're more multicultural than ever as U.S. uh, residents. And I would also say around the globe, which is great from a DEI perspective and that we are more multicultural and finding value across the different types of people. But it's something we should think about. Well, what's changed about this type of marketing based on cultural preferences or practices since you've been in this work? Oh, my God. (laughs) Where do I start? (laughs) Uh, The cultural marketing shift has been so dramatic, especially in the last four to five years. With the advent of social and digital marketing, almost every Fortune 500 company has moved away from investing in marketing to reach multicultural consumers, especially Hispanics, believing that most U.S. Hispanics are English dominant and can be reached with mainstream media. They've now moved to just translate ads uh, if they feel they need to have some presence 
on Spanish language media. I mean, it feels like we're back to the early 80s, unfortunately. They've moved from utilizing multicultural marketing experts and agencies to using global agencies or national agencies. And my humble opinion is that it's, it's a big mistake. And it's probably cost many companies millions of dollars in potential sales. I think back, you know, a perfect example of leaning in and understanding culture as a way to reach Hispanic consumers was when I led Coke's Hispanic marketing efforts, we signed Selena as a spokesperson. You know, Coke was a sponsor of the Tejano Music Awards. That was like the Texas Hispanic Grammys. And when I saw the audience reaction to her performance, I knew that we had to sign her. She was only 17 years old and sweet and bubbly like a Coca-Cola classic. She was the epitome of a strong, smart, stylish, talented, family center, authentic young Latina that our community could be proud of. We worked with her for about five years before she was taken from us. And in that time, our association with her resulted in garnering the Hispanic community's respect because Coke acknowledged and supported and promoted her talent. And this ultimately produced incremental sales volume, not just in Texas, but throughout the United States. So I guess my point to this is respecting and acknowledging one's heritage culture is really the key to gaining the respect of the Hispanic community. We worked with a professor of Latin American studies over the last few years. His name was Dr. Supervi, and he said it, he said it best. You can reach Latinos in a common language, but you get to their heart through their culture. And Selena touched that cultural cord, and she still does. And that association helped Coca-Cola remain the number one soft drink in the country for many, many years. Yeah, there was a lot of heart equity, I think, that they gained through that campaign. And kudos to you for seeing that opportunity, right, before others did and really helping her have that platform and elevating our community. She's still beloved to this day. In some ways, it's amazing for me to see New generations know her story, know who she is, and recognize all that. Yeah. And I think that is really powerful that you share. The point is, and particularly in public relations, I would say, and in, in the marketing, right, we, we have work to do there, is to get to people's hearts, to get them to care. And the culture is based on values. And so you can only do that through understanding what do they care about? What's the music? What's the food? What is the type of language? And the big difference, I, I just wrote my next PRSA column about this. The big difference in terms of translation and when to use Spanish, when it's not, it's all about that preferences. And this tailoring, like what does this segment of the community need who I'm trying to connect with and what would they appreciate? So I appreciate that you see this and that you're still willing to be an advocate for basing your marketing strategy on culture and practices that really matter to people. So thank you for that. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we did produce spots with Selena in English and we ran them on television, but she was Latina and she represented the culture in a beautiful way. We also did them in Spanish and ran them on Univision and Telemundo. So she had a crossover appeal that worked against both English-dominant and Spanish-dominant Hispanics throughout the country. So there is magic. I mean, if you know and you have the insights to understand how to utilize the right either celebrity talent or the right cultural cues, whether it's a family sitting around the dinner table or a quinceanera. I mean, just understanding those cultural cues that both English dominant and Spanish dominant Latinos can relate to. Yeah. And I think why a lot of Latinos really were interested and excited by Selena at the time was that, yes, her music was Tejano and Tejano is in Spanish. I heard Tejano was in Spanish, but she spoke English. And a big part of her story was, I'm not fluent in Spanish. I wish I was. Yeah, that was so relatable. <laughs> so, that's my story. And I was a little girl and I saw it. And I think that's what's important is that you can't do direct 
Google translations and think that'll work. And yes, a lot of times English may be the right language, but are you using the right term and the right colors and the right visuals and all that should be thought about. And it's really not that hard. So with all that's changed and so much that's the same, Bonnie, like what do you think hasn't changed in all this time that we should remember about multicultural marketing or Hispanic marketing? Well, what's not changed is that the market continues to grow, I mean, and grow and growing. <laughs> in 2017, there were more than 59 million Hispanics living in the United States. And by 2030, 75 million. I mean, we're a country within a country. That's not going to change. We're just shy of the size of Germany and 10 million more people in France. It's a country. And what's changed is the purchasing power. I mean, in 2015, it was 1.3 trillion. At the end of 2021, it was 2 trillion. I don't know any company that wouldn't want a piece of that. No, exactly. And I think that's everything. Like we're a growing population. This is growing in numbers. This is growing in value to all types of organizations. You know, even like I mentioned, Bonnie, understanding from a volunteer recruitment perspective, if you can't capture the hearts of a community where the majority population is Latino, well, you're not going to get all the volunteers you need. So this is really powerful. Well, you've certainly been a trailblazer for Latinas and leadership in particular, Bonnie. You wrote a book about it. So tell us about your book, Dale Ganas, and what's inspired you to write it. Well, I was inspired to write a book of consejos. Dale Ganas is a book of consejos. And for those of you that don't know, Dale Ganas means give it all you have, right? So these consejos were words of advice that my parents gave me as a child, but also advice that I lived throughout my career's journey, you know? Many of my career choices were in male-dominant fields, and there were very, very few women in broadcasting or walking the halls of corporate America, and even fewer women of color. And so I was there, and there was no one that looked like me. So I didn't really have a support system. I didn't have mentors. And I just felt that I needed to share some of my experiences with other women who may be in the same position. So that was the inspiration of Daleganas. The more I can inspire others, the more I'll continue to be inspired. So that was the crux of why I decided to just sit down and write those stories and pass on those words of advice. Yeah, and you personally, so you know, Bonnie, and everyone here knows that you have inspired me. I have a book coming out this fall, and part of that was I really liked what you were sharing with me before. And just for transparency listeners, Bonnie and I worked together. She gave me the honor of helping her with her book publicity and promotion, and that was so amazing. And I got a lot of free mentoring advice out of that, Bonnie, and from your book, and <laughs> really inspired me to, you know what, I want to make sure I leave a legacy as well. It was so hard for me to figure out how to work and do the work I do in this field. And I didn't know anyone like me who did it before. And a couple of people took a chance on me and I wanted to pay it forward. And I loved how you put your advice in a book and that was a great leave behind. So you definitely inspired me to do that too. So I want to pay tribute to you with that, Bonnie. Well, thank you, Melissa. And congratulations on your book. I can't wait to read it. Thank you, thank you. Well, from your thoughts, Bonnie, is there any last piece of advice you'd like to pass along to our listeners who a lot of them are communicators or really aspiring new pros who may want to follow a path like yours? Hmm. There's so many. Just to take a couple of things out of my book, the advice that I try to leave with women and young girls when I go out and have these speaking engagements are my top five are, and you know this one, Melissa, be fearless. Do not be afraid to step out of your comfort zone. If I had been fearful to move to Detroit or to Atlanta, uh, where I didn't know anyone, I would never have had the opportunities that I had with the companies I worked for. If I had been too afraid to just leave that comfortable job at Coke and write my own business plan, I wouldn't have owned a business for 24 years. So be fearless, mm -hmm. you know. The second one, and you and I talked about this the other day, is eliminate that self-doubt. 
to this day, even after my long career, I, I still doubt whether I'm good enough, whether people want to hear my ideas or whether our campaigns are going to be brilliant. You know, I, I still have a lot of self-doubt, but you have to put that aside mm-hmm. and, and try to just stay positive and confident every step of the way. The other one is there are no glass ceilings if you're brave enough to break them. I hit glass ceilings, glass wall. I was in a glass bubble for for years (laughs) and couldn't get out of it until I decided to break it and and say, you know, I want to own my own business and I'm going to figure out how to do it. And it was a huge risk for me. So don't be afraid to to break that glass bubble or that glass ceiling. Mm -hmm. Another piece of advice and this I believe wholeheartedly, and I've lived this, is that no one is perfect, but a team can be. I have always surrounded myself with people that were smarter than me and not be intimidated by their smarts and let them shine. And I want to learn from them, you know, because when you have a team that has the skill sets that maybe you don't have, lean on them. And that makes you look smarter. So in business, Teams are everything, and I believe that wholeheartedly, and I've lived that my entire career. And last but not least, it's not how many times you fall. It's how many times you get back up. There were times in my career, and especially on this side of the business, owning my own agency, where at the drop of a hat, I get a call from a major corporation that I have been doing business with for 14 years didn't do anything wrong. We were doing great work for them, but they decided to create some efficiencies and use one agency and they eliminated all their multicultural agencies. Mm. And now keep in mind, this was a $5 million piece of business. For me to lose that overnight, the trickle down effect to my business and my employees was horrific. And that day, I just did not want to get back up. Mm. Yeah, I can't imagine. I can't imagine. I mean, you're honest. And I think that's what's been so hard for me to understand. You talk about glassy leans and the glass bubble. Sometimes I'm like, what am I not seeing here? Right? That's that concept of glass ceiling. What am I not understanding about why I'm stuck somewhere? And honestly, Bonnie, I think it's because a lot of leaders and big agency owners aren't honest about how hard it is. And scary it is and how devastating it can be when someone's mind just changes or a new chief marketing officer wants to do it their way or with their agency colleagues, right? Exactly. Then I've seen it. Yeah, I've seen it, feel it. And so when someone like you is honest and says, this is what happened and this is what we did about it and here's how I persevered. I think especially for professionals of color, we need those stories so much. So thank you for being vulnerable and sharing that because that's what makes change in my book. Yeah, and it happens. And it happened in the last 24 years countless times. But you have to dust yourself off. You just have to say, okay, Mm -hmm. you know, you have to pivot. You have to adjust and you have to make the decision, do I want to stay in the game? And how am I going to do it to be able to get through this tsunami? And uh, and then that's it. And you keep moving forward. That's all you can do. That's right. You get back up, right, Bonnie? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I love it. Well, those are really important takeaways. I think a lot of it has to do with you feel that fear. You are uncertain. You make the most strategic, best choice you can. And you just keep trying. And dale ganas. I like it. Dale ganas. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love these kind of conversations, Bonnie, and thanks again for being a part of it. I call this kind of conversation where we share that intelligent exchange of dialogue, smart talk. So what does smart talk mean to you? Smart talk is a quality of the conversation between people. And obviously, this was great quality conversation. And it's the ability to ask hard questions and then be truthful and authentic with your answers. And, uh, you know, it's not about using big words to sound smart. (laughs) It's about being authentic and facing those hard questions with truthful responses. 
Love it. Love it. Well, this has been great. And I'm sure many of our listeners will want to connect with you on their own. What's the best way for our listeners to connect with you online and get their own copy of Dale Ganas? Well, my email address is ygarcia at mbculture.com. And for the book, if you go to daleganasbook.com, click on buy book if you want to buy it. <laughs> and I have them available there, both in hard and soft copy. We can either mail them to you or you can pick them up. And if you pick them up, I'm happy to sign them for you. Yes, come on down, San Antonio. We'd love to see more of our friends from the Smart Talk series. Well, thank you, Bonnie, for sharing your knowledge and your heart with us today. Thank you so much, Melissa. It was great. Always, always enjoy having our conversation. So thanks so much for the invitation. And thank you to our listeners for joining us for today's episode. We love unpacking communication topics to elevate our industry practice. Keep an eye out for the release of Smart Talk, the book, this fall by following the podcast and our MVW communication social media channels. And if you enter your email at mvw360.com slash book, you'll get updates on the release of my book. You'll be the first to know every milestone we make. And as always, think smart and communicate smart. And I'll see you next time. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Smart Talk series. If you learned something or enjoyed our conversation, share on social media or send to a friend. To learn more about this and other communication topics, visit mvw360.com. That's mvw360.com.